Hey, it's Cigar Saturday Live. We're back with our first episode of the new year. So glad to have all of you watching. It's myself, of course, Tom Fisher, Maddie Rock there, along with Sanj, and our very special guest, it's Monty from Monty and the Pharaoh. You know Monty and the Pharaoh, the number one pro wrestling broadcast. How's everybody doing? I'm glad to be on the bourbon blog, man. Finally, it's it's finally arrived. So you know what? I think after this is I'm retiring. I'm done. Good. So. Good. And retiring with some bourbon, in fact. There you go. <laughs> Matt, I think Maddie's can we can you hear us, Maddie? Oh, I think Maddie's already retired. How about how about now? Can, can, now, can yeah. Now now? I was gonna say Maddie and Sanj, it looks like they've already retired, it seems. We're, we were doing that all the time. Sanj is still Sanj still hasn't slept from last week's friggin' giant to do about this man, so he's a little bit beat up right now. He kind of tired as hell. Tom. He, he thinks he's fucking oh. Batman right now, <laughs> dude. If you if you told him right now, dude, you got to go get your Batman costume from the inside of the bathroom. You go running and take off. <laughs> well, it's a it was a big week for you, Sanj. What tell us about the? I see you're smoking one. Tell us about the release. So we released the uh, SB Black. Uh, on my 31 year anniversary, January 7th, last Saturday. Wow. And um, with a good um, 80,000 cigars are gone. Wow. That's uh, that's amazing. And the uh, unfortunate thing is a lot of my, so this year we added five more retail partners. So from 35, now this year is 40, and I don't have enough product. To give it to we only give cigars to only four shops so far so they're gonna have to wait for another two and a half three weeks 80 80 80 thousand yes. for gone gone wow. gone right now we don't have anything a lot that's a lot of happy people so you remember that big box that we took pictures of and i showed you it that that's gone those stacks that look like buildings there Seven were so many pallets there were so many people here and so many people smoking. So there's over 300 people here. Do you know when I fart, I still blows out smoke, cigar smoke. Yeah. That's how many people were here. It's like, great. I don't need, I could, that's how I send out smoke signals. Now I don't, I don't text anymore. With, with that many, with that many cigars, how'd you even have room to fart? Exactly. Well, nobody knew, you know, it was kind of, no. it was good. I got to blame other people, but uh, it was, it was a big deal. Yeah, man. A lot of people, a lot of support, a lot of boxes gone that day, you know, and uh, so this year we, we did something a little different than last year. So this year we added uh, four different places. So originally we gave them 100 boxes each to launch it on January 7th. The guy in Michigan, Ronnie, he pre-sold 184 boxes before the even event even took place. And, wow. you know, they couldn't believe it. And this is the cigars no one had tried. So people like, how to help people buying the cigars like that? And, you know, all the answers. I mean, you see social media, Instagram is loaded with SPs. And people from all over, they're loving it, you know? Yes. Uh, Mo Monty and I are going to look forward to trying them, aren't we, Monty? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm shipping your package out uh, Monday, Tom. I'm excited. Yeah, and I, I just didn't have any time. So Oh, don't worry. We're going to – we're 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 just – we're craving them. We're, we're getting this – Excited smell. I, I. <laughs> yeah, kidding, on, gonna, look at that. And, and Tom, you, you're gonna like this blend. So, this is nothing we ever made. This is a little bit uh, uh, fuller body, but it has like uh, almost 65% of dark cocoa. And oh. so, the mini it's a it's a seven blend tobacco. So, there's only three cigars exist today, are made with seven different tobacco. One is the David of Oro, which yeah. is $550 a cigar. And that's also blended by Hilario Diaz. And the Opus Perfection X, the holiday one, I think is like 175, 180 a cigar. With that right? tobacco in it. And these cigars are nine, 10, 11, and twelve dollars. And this is you've got to feel it. When you get it, you've got to feel it. It feels like a purse. So you could tell tell what I tell you. So you see the gradient printing on there, right? So with yeah, the textures. Yeah. And uh let we'll me do a quick this opens up out from here. And it just slides open. Uh, and you push from the bottom, it actually slides up. Slides up. Very high-end packaging, vinyl coated. So if somebody has a humidor, walking humidor, it's not going to affect anything. And um, 
this prices are from 1992. In 92, the cigars were 9, 10, 11, and $12, and it's identical price 30 years later. Same quality, same construction, same everything behind it, you know? And yeah. um, I guess that's why people know our reputation and people just buying it blindly. And so far, yes, not a single person in the United States have complained about this cigar of any kind. I know it's going to be amazing, just like the last one. What what did those five hundred dollars cigars go for in nineteen ninety two? Did they even sell them that expensive back then? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, ninety two, uh, you had a core line. So if you look at at the time, Dunhill, Davidoff, uh, they were they were very expensive Great cigars. Cliff. Great, Cliff. Great Cliff, but Great Cliff yeah, at that time you could only buy it at the. Uh, you know, uh, he, we had one complaint, by the way. Glenn's behind us, and he's complaining that there's none left. So if you want to come use that as a complaint, go for it. Mark it. Um, you know, so Great Cliff at the time, you had to be at their hotel to get it. You know, right. it wasn't for general uh, public. You know, it wasn't in any retail shop. But at, back in the day, Paul Grammarian, PG, they were very expensive. You know, so they had That's a lot a of nice cigars back in the day. You know, oh, but sure. back in the day. Even believe it or not, 30 years ago, $12 for a good cigar was considered nothing. And right. today, 30 years later, $12 is underpriced cigar. If you ask somebody, if you know, I, I, I'm smoking $12 cigar, they tell you, oh, you're smoking cheap cigars. No, I think how, it's how, can I ask this question? How, how are cigars, uh, something like that, how is that uh, recession proof? How are you still getting that same price? How does that work? Well, it's not, it's not that we're getting the same price. Uh, so today's market, the way I, I explain to a lot of my guys and a lot of people, you know, in every blog and podcast I'm invited to, right. everything, the inflated pricing today is a manufacturer's greed. You know? So, you know, it's most cigars, there is no cigar costs you more than $2. I don't think there is any fucking cigar in the market. The manufacturer costs more than, you know, $2. So let's they Let's say you're bringing it to the United States. That's uh, 40 cents S ship tax, 17 cents uh, uh, VAT tax, right? So you're looking at about 260 a cigar, the most expensive. How the fuck that cigar MSRP becomes $24, $28, $29? That's all manipulated pricing. It's a manufacturers make more money. 80% of the cigars that exist today in the market. The packaging is worth more than the tobacco inside. Remember that. Right. So what are we what are we talking about? Like 800, 800 points margin on a cigar? Is Absolutely. that what we're talking about right now? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Not with us. We make 42 cents a cigar. Well, times yeah. 80,000 80, cigars, that's not too bad though, right? Well, get, but that's the point. Listen, you after 9-11... This is my one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things. I always tell people, right? After 9-11, gasoline in America for car was $5.90, $5.80, $6, depending where you were, right? And then after that, the very first quarter, Exxon uh, reported $1.5 billion profit. And people, all the Americans, all fucking dumb Americans, went off and said, how the fuck are you making, you know, you jacking up prices, you're making money. And they came out with the statement. Most people don't know. Exxon only makes penny a gallon, even today. Mm. But, hey, stop driving eight-cylinder, 12-cylinder cars. If right. you can't worry about it, right? So nobody wants to assume the responsibility. They all want to point the fucking finger. And I know that's, I guess, the way. But if you look at it, Exxon said, listen, if he can't make a penny a gallon, then what the fuck are we doing here? And same thing. Listen, if I can make 40 cents, I don't want to make $4.80 a cigar. I want to make 40 cents. I don't want to make $10 a cigar that cost me $1.50. Right? And $2 being very high in tobacco. So, you know, cigars are from 40 cents to $2. $2 being creme de la creme. Right. So, 90% of these cigars can meet standards. So, you know, if you say, hey, Sanj, I want to invest 100 grand. Guess what? You could convert that hundred grand less than a year, three hundred thousand. But we're not doing that. I want to give right product to right people for a great price, and that's why I guess if you look at Instagram and anywhere, you see nothing but SPs all over the place. There is no cigar 
posted like SPs anywhere. Well, and people love it. You know, listen, 90% of the people that buy stuff, I don't even know them because we don't do online sales. So, you know, the other three retail partners did online sell and all their clients are posting and they're like, how the fuck this is possible? And that's the whole concept behind that. Well, I can't wait to try them uh, again. These are um, at least this batch is done uh, for now. I mean, you may find them a few places, but they're all spoken for, right, Sanj? Yeah. So we don't have. We probably have like eight, nine boxes left, right. and that's it. You but know. The so, says, I see some people already saying they're on their way. Yeah. So, so also the, this cigar. What makes it special, Tom? Yeah. It's a Dominican wrapper. Uh, Mexican San Andres binder, but it's aged one year in a whiskey barrel. Ooh. And there is five other tobacco in a uh, filler. So it's a seven tobacco cigar. So only three cigars in the market today exist. So more tobacco you have, more more blending, more know-how you need to do. More you, you know apply, complexity changes. Incredible. And a whiskey, do we want to talk about whiskey barrels? Do we weakness in that tobacco is second to none. Yeah. You're definitely getting that sweet, dark cocoa taste. You're getting that, that, um, that like a goju pepper. You're not, it's not like the height, like a lot of people talk about white pepper, yeah. white pepper, white. This is not white pepper taste. This is like that sweet pepper that coincides with the dark cocoa. Like when you have those Mexican chocolates that have the, the, the pepper and the chocolate, that's right. the kind of distinction that you're going to oh, get on yeah. the stick. So, Tom, you'll get them, and uh, and Mike, either I'll see you next week, or, or or we'll ship you out some to try, brother. And then uh, while we're we're taking the horn, Mike, let everybody know what uh, what you guys have been up to there, brother. Yes. So so uh, we're Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, uh, where we shoot every Thursday out of Indie Music TV uh, from nine to ten p.m. We're on all social media, and then we have a you know about twice a month some weekend shows where we bring in some of the old school wrestlers, new school wrestlers, do some uh, two-on-one interviews. But it's not just, it's it's not, uh, I don't know if you guys know the terminology, but it's not a shoot interview uh, where it's just a question and answer. We do a lot of uh, game playing, uh, some music. You know, we're a variety show. So the idea behind the show is we bring these wrestlers, if you're a wrestling fan, and we bring some... Um, you know, B and C celebrities into the studio. And, you know, we kind of get the inner thoughts, their political views, their religious views, you know, beyond the usual, you know, wrestling questions that go on. And uh, the show has been highly successful, at least for the last two years. Um, most recently, YouTube knocked our channel off for being too controversial. And we thought about maybe calling it a day, but we restarted. And within a month, uh, we're already almost back to where we were. So um, not too bad. What What was so controversial? What 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 exactly happened? Well, you know, we, you know, uh, we're both uh, big believers of freedom of speech, no matter what you think of, right? If we have alternative views on what's going on in the world or within the right. United States. That's fine. But we asked the question and the guest answers the question. Well, you know, in today's society, if you answer a question that doesn't go along uh, with the PC narrative, right. uh, you know, you kind of get silenced. Uh, we were getting suspended almost every other week for commentary from our guests, you know, and uh, you can't have an alternative view uh, from Whatever the fuck it is. Well, let's put it this way. I'm, I'm trying to be politically correct here. If you're on the left, you're okay. If you veer off the left, you're going to find problems. You you will be silenced at one point or, or another. Well, it's uh, – but you got back on. That's the good news. Is it, it did, Was there something you guys had to do to get back on? No, we had a – well, you know, the bigger problem here is, you know, again, the, the show costs money and right. – uh, you know, we have a, a boatload of sponsors. Uh, we're on all social media where we, we get paid by all these social media channels. But uh, when you lose an outlet, for example, of YouTube, that's a that's a sufficient uh, amount of money to lose within a month's period. Right. And the rebuild to where you were, 
it, 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 it's it's tough and uh, it's it's an issue. So again, we just reopened the channel. We had over a thousand videos. We had a re-upload, and you know where we were getting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views. Now you're not getting that same amount of views, which in turn you make less money. But the thing is, we've got new content. The new now the new content is flowing, and uh, we're, we're doing we're doing fine. So uh, we expect to be back. And again, my our goal this year is to get onto terrestrial radio. Uh, we feel at this point we have the goods to knock it out. Again, this was just a shits and giggles uh, thing that we were doing, two older guys just screwing around, and it just became very popular. So, you know, there's some legs behind it. So we want to we want to take a shot and see how we can do. Yeah, and I'm putting uh, where to find uh, these uh, these wonderful guys up up on uh, or down below, so you can. Follow their channel, and we 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 we're all about uh, the freedom of speech and 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 supporting supporting you all. Uh, so glad to see that you're back at it there on YouTube. Uh, and go on, go into a little more detail. How this uh, listened to the podcast, watched your videos. Uh, how did this whole thing start, and and how did it blossom? It's a great story. Well, you know, um, some. Way back to a three and a half years ago, over social media, someone asked me to guest host on one of their shows on another station. I guess I'm I'm new to this, right? So in my real life, I'm a, you know I'm a director for a company, and you know I was like, ah, hey, you know what? This is a good bucket thing to do, right? Like a bucket list thing. So I go in there, we have a good time. He asked me to come on the following week, and then before you know it, I'm just on there every week, right? And um, my friend, Jimmy Farrow, uh, I knew him from high school. We hadn't spoken for God knows how long, 10, or 10 years or so. And he had seen me on there. He reached out to me. And then before you knew it, he was kind of guesting on the show. And then we, me and Jimmy have this some sort of chemistry, right? I don't know where, where it's from, but we're on two different sides of the planet. And we kind of run off of each other and we... Uh, you know, we, we just have crazy conversations and uh, funny stuff. And we ended up saying, hey, we're just going to do our own show. And we had another station contact us and they're like, hey, we'd like to have you at our station. It'll be a paid gig. We moved over there. And, you know, again, I was new to the whole thing. Basically, everybody was using Facebook at the time. And as it started to advance, we started going on to other social media platforms, you know, like Facebook was the starting thing and then Twitter and it just all starts building from there. And then once we got onto YouTube, that's when the popularity started coming because we were giving uh, fans out there material that they haven't seen. Right. Because all that was out there basically was, hey, I'm going to ask you a question about wrestling. You're going to answer. Then I'm going to ask you another question. You're going to answer. Uh, we we came with this variety show, right? And asking questions that wouldn't normally be, you know, be asked, and challenging questions too, right? Um, you know, Rock knows. Uh, Rock and I have spoke about it. The wrestling world is a crazy, crazy. It's there's not there's there's nothing like it. Right. And then when you get all those personalities and everything, to give you a funny one, sorry. All right, we, we got uh, poor Tom. You're going to get kicked a little bit on this one. So one of our first wrestling guests was uh, was Sags. So oh. you can you you can imagine poor Tom. Poor Tom got a real real entrance into the wrestling world with Sag with Sags being one of the uh, with one of the first guests. And that's the cool thing about wrestlers. They keep it even if they're in you know we'll call it the, the kayfabe gimmick whatever. It's still the essence of reality for something like I said that you wouldn't think you're going to get. You're going to get guys that are really forthcoming. You're going to get guys that are more than particularly honest and truthful. So when you interview guys like this, it's kind of it's kind of like how their lives are in the wrestling world. It's no holds barred, and very much the same. And you get you got you got you got Mike and Farrow doing it. You're getting the best out of these guys because there's no holds barred. You're asking them; they're treating their life outside of the ring and doing shows like this just like they do on the ins inside the ring. So you get really really wild shit. And you know, Tom seeing it, we've had. Andrew Anderson on, we've had Nana on, uh, we've had Lloyd on, we've had Rikishi on. So we've had, a, you know, a bunch of different people where you're like, all right, this is cool that, you know, it's the same kind of thing. It gives you the same adrenaline, you know, 
in the ring and outside of the ring. And that's what makes what, you know, what, 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 what Monty and the Pharaoh do such an important thing to the people who really want to kind of know more without, you know, here's, here's the guidelines of what you have to do. Kind of what we do here, Tom, everything's open form, free form. Everybody speaks their mind. And when you get to that kind of crowd, they're just going to speak their mind because that's, that's what part of being a professional wrestler is put it all out there because you're given everything uh, that your body can do to perform and be out there. So they're going to give you everything on the other end too. And when they're, when they're on camera and when they're doing interviews and when they're doing shows, so it makes, you know, it makes for a wild ride. Well, add on that, right. They, you know, they, they do so many of these, these, these shoot interviews, right. And it, it's got to become very boring to them at some point. So the questions we ask them, you could see they're kind of like a caged animal, right? They can't believe these questions are coming at them and they want to answer them, right? Because who the hell doesn't want to talk about what's going on in the United States right now? Who doesn't want to talk about President Biden or former President Trump? Who doesn't want to talk about the vaccine and COVID and, and on and on and on and on? And then before you know it, they're in a relaxed state because, look, again, we don't take cheap shots, right? We ask a question. You answer it. You don't want to answer it. In fact, we had Enzo on today. He didn't want to answer a question. We moved on. Doesn't happen often, but but then you start getting the emotion of the wrestler, right? And uh, you know, that's um, that's the most I get out of it when you can see the raw emotion and they they break down in tears and they start thinking about their uh, former friends who have passed away or maybe some family members or. You know, God forbid there was a murder or whatever the situation is. So when you watch my and, and then again, on the light side, you get to see a wrestler sing a song with my partner. Right. I mean, who, who wants who doesn't want to see that? Or right. we'll play a game called Hit It or Quit It, where we put some hot women on there and they give us their analysis, whether they would hit it or they quit it. But it's not just answer. Right. They have to explain it and they enjoy it. These guys actually come on the show. They sit back. They relax. They have a few beers if it's at nighttime, and they enjoy it. And for me, being an old wrestling fan, what an honor. What a humbling experience, right? And then, look at this. Then you start meeting other people like yourself or Rock, and then you see these other people in the world, and you start getting into these other venues, and you're like, holy shit, there's a lot of other stuff out there instead of the little box that I've been living in for the last uh, 51 years, you know? Right. Yeah, you all, you definitely, uh, you you dig deeper, uh, you go further. I think that's so important. I mean, that's what, uh, that's what a good interview is, is to uh, make that happen. Um, what, is there something in your, in your experience that, that led you to want to, to, to have a show that would dig deeper, that would do this? Did it, was it more of a natural, um, Natural unfolding as you as you found your voices on the show. So, like I said, it was a bucket list thing, and you know the evolution was let's just do what everybody else is doing, right? Because you don't know any better. And me personally, right? I'm a sports guy. I love sports. I grew up loving professional wrestling. But if you tell me, hey, Mike, do you love it? Like, do you live it? No, man, I don't. I don't. I, I like the old school guys because of the memories that they've given me when I was a child or when I was in my teens and I would go to Madison Square Garden and see these guys. But I said to myself, I, as a person, right, in my real life, I'm a manager and I manage people. I've been doing that for 30 something years. I like the inner workings of the human being, right? I love the thought process of the human beings. And I said to Pharaoh, I don't want to do a show asking wrestling questions. Of course you ask wrestling questions, right? It is a wrestling show. But I said, I want to know more, right? And I want I want this to be different. And it may not work, right? People, you know, there's people that don't like the show, right? They write, you guys suck, uh, you know, ask some wrestling questions. But I think people in life are conditioned to a certain expectation, right? We're conditioned animals and you have to teach them that there's something better. And that's where I think the popularity of the show came from, right? Because we were teaching the audience, hey, look, you've been fed this cake for 10 years, right? This is all you know. 
we're giving you something different. We're giving you something to chew on, something to think about, something to get emotion out of you, whether I hate these guys, I love these guys, I hate this question, I hate Donald Trump, I hate Joe Biden, whatever the question is, we're getting you some emotion. We're, we're here to entertain, right? It's about entertainment. Yeah. Do, so do you almost, no, it's so important. Do, do you feel like that you've... Um, <laughs> do you feel like you've done something right by getting these kinds of responses by by hearing um, from from those that that don't like what you're doing? I mean, does there is there an encouragement in that? In the negativity, um, yeah. at first, my partner uh, he was a little thin skinned, right? He's a, he's an artist, right? He's a he was a popular musician when he was younger, and you know, musicians need a certain type of love, right? Me, on the other hand. I, 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 again, I, I, I don't feed off hatred, but I, it doesn't bother me. Right. You could say right. what you want to me. I don't care. Listen again, I want to entertain people. You know, I will tell you the biggest thrill I get. I get a big thrill when people will write us and say, Hey, look, uh, we've had people say you saved my life. I, mm. I wanted to kill myself, but you made me laugh. And then every Thursday when I tuned in, I laughed and you know, as cliche as this may sound, it's like if you're making a difference in one person's life, you're kind of doing your job. So, again, I don't I don't consider myself a, you know, a, a star or I don't have this uh, grand, you know, dreams of being a star. But I do believe that I have created something that no one else did has. And um, and I do think that we're making a difference in people's lives and that's to me that to me is the most important thing that is that is so important and that's i mean to hear that you've um you know had had a message like that come in that's i mean that is really something deep and and powerful I and mean, that's really great um, and the fact that they keep it real time like i said and that's that's right. the fun is of what they do because you look right. at a lot of stuff and you can kind of tell you know there, it's it's restrictive or there's there's a governor on it and a few all yep. these guys and, and, and you know there's not and as far as media is going you know you unfortunately see more and more of that stuff where things things are muted um so like i said it's important that you see stuff like this where, where you have people coming back people asking the questions that other people want to hear without being censored right and that's kind of what we do and that's why right. you know look look at other businesses look at on this side of the business with, with somebody like sanj Sanj doesn't give a shit. Sanj is just going to say it the way it is. It could ruffle feathers. It could piss people off. Um, I've been doing what I've been doing for 30 years. Not all the things I say are popular. And, you know, you hear my famous thing, like, if you're asking me the question, I'm, I'm going to answer you. And I said, you might not like what I have to say, but I'm going to be honest. So, so what do you want? You know, and that's like everything in the world today. You want, you know, people like politicians that, that lie, right? Make things sound pretty and everything else. Um, then when you hear somebody, you know, let's use just good old state of New Jersey for it. I remember when uh, Chris Christie came in, he said he was going to tax the shit out of everybody. Nobody was immune. Nobody, you know, high five. As soon as the guy got in, like, what do you mean you're taxing me? I'm like, dude, you're not used to a politician. He, he, he told you what he was doing, man. I mean, he straight up told you what was going down. Um, and like I said, and that's important. So when you get guys like like, uh, like Mike and, and, and Farrow, when you get people like Sanj, Sanj has been doing what he's doing. When you're doing what you're doing for a really long time, and you have the knowledge and you have everything else, you don't have, uh, there's no fear in telling people real stuff, right? If you're keeping it real. And the joke is, is you think of everything like a courtroom. There, there's slander, there's libel. But if you're telling somebody your experience with something, you might not want to hear it, but that's not slander. That's not libel. That's that's an experience that you've had. Um, and like I said, and, the, and these guys do the same thing. They're talking about what they know or what they've witnessed or what they've been through. And that's really to to me, you know, you and I, you know, over 130 episodes, right? We've kept it that way. Say what's on your mind. Let people know what you think. And, you know, that's that to me, I think, is important. Being censured, to me, doesn't make for a good show or a good TV or, or, or good radio. Uh, it just doesn't, you know. And sometimes controversy is just that. There's going to be controversy to what you say or what you do. But um, that probably means you do it right. What's to say? If somebody doesn't hate you or, or hating on you, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> you, you know, you know, Ted... Ted DiBiase said in our studio, if you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing, right? And 
in life, especially at our ages, right? You 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 can't walk the 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 center line of the road, right? You got to be on the left or the right, and you and you got to be honest with yourself. And you've got no matter what, forget about doing a show. Just in life in general, you have to tell people exactly how you feel. I think to, for too long we were raised to really say, keep it keep it censored, right? Keep your feelings to yourself. Talk to your wife. Talk to your mom and dad about it, right? But don't tell anybody else what you really think. I say bullshit. You tell people what you think. If people don't like it, they'll let you know, right? right. But you but you do it respectfully too, right? You, you know, I always believe that uh, everybody has a right to their opinion. We don't. Again, we don't all have to agree, but we should be intelligently talking about it. That's right. Yep, I think that's that's very very important. To everything, like I said, keeping it real, keeping it honest, and it, at the end of the day, you're going to offend some people. But I I do believe that most people's preference is to really know what you're thinking. Yes, yes, and keeping it real is is uh, is what's uh, I think a big part of what's helped you guys continue to grow the personality the the personalities you featured the personality of the show. Uh, again, tell people where they can find you and maybe also just tell us, you know, tease forward. What's, how's the show growing? What's, what's the next steps for the show? So we're, we're Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. We're on all social media, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, uh, name it. We're on it. We're on all the audio channels and we're also on New York cable on channel 115 on every Tuesday and Saturday, Tuesdays at uh, 9 p.m. and Saturdays at 11.30 a.m. and Channel 20 at 7 p.m. Um, my partner is Jimmy Farrow. Jimmy Farrow is the actual star of the show. Jimmy um, Jimmy is a true entertainer, a former music artist, loves the world of professional wrestling, idolizes every one of these guys that, that come in there, and... Uh, the reason Jimmy uh, is as good as he is is because he truly has that passion. And honestly, Jimmy is one of the, the nicest people you'll ever meet, right? He doesn't ever want to offend anybody. He wants to entertain. He wants you to love him. And uh, to be honest with you, Jimmy is the reason why the show is where it's at now. Where do we want to go into the future? Look, we want to be the best out there for what we're doing. We want to be the show that everybody wants to see. We want to knock anybody, all these OGs that were there before us, we want to knock them off their ledge. And then again, we want to pull back the curtain, right? Because all in the world of wrestling, you know, as Rock knows, you got a lot of fake wrestlers out there that, that just bullshit their way through things. And more importantly, you've got a lot of fake agents out there that, we're in the biz when guys like us weren't, I'm not saying we're in the biz, but we weren't involved. It was their own little Idaho, right? They're unhappy that two fans from New York have come in and knocked down the door of professional wrestling. Their form of entertainment has destroyed everybody before them, everybody after them. We are numero uno and they don't like it. Well, we want to expose these frauds that have been running this industry for the last 30 years. We want to tell people how fake they are and the bullshit and they're not special and they're just gimmicking everything out like a lot of these wrestlers are. We want to expose that because you know what? The fans have that right to know. The fans have that right to be treated with the respect that they deserve for spending their hard-earned money for 30-something years, right? So the good guys, you're protecting the good guys, because what happens, uh, especially, you know, SAG spoke about it. Uh, Drew spoke about it. Remember, Lloyd spoke about it. You have some of these guys that are working on your behalf, these promoters and these agents, man. And uh, and they're just, you know, excuse my French, you're just fucking you left, right and center. Um, and, you know, this is your live lead, especially especially when you're not out. If you're not wrestling, you're going to go out on the road and you're doing appearances and everything else, you know. Either they don't they don't pay you, they give you deposit and disappear. You got to chase them for money. They cancel a show two days before, and you know it puts these guys in a rough spot because they've been doing they've been entertaining people for years. And you know what you're you're not their reward is not to be screwed over by having these guys take their money, run and do nothing. Um, I you know 
we haven't mentioned names. Maybe, you know, maybe later we will. We won't. It depends how, how you protect people. The wrestlers have had uh, have used a couple names before, but you know, we'll leave that to uh, to Mike to Mike and uh, Jimmy to talk about that. But you know, what are you doing as a pr to protect these guys that have been out there entertaining you for so long? Like, um, I love you. You know, I love Tony. I love Tony to pieces, Tony Atlas. Um, you know what? Not a young man anymore. So people, you know, people will try to take advantage of what he's doing. And I've been to places where I've seen it. was like, and we know how Tony talks. Oh, Matty, these people, Matty, Matty, vultures, Matty. You see what the, oh, I cannot believe, Matty, what, what they're doing. And I'm like, you know what? You are 500% correct. It's bullshit. Um, I don't do this anymore, but let, let, let's go see what we could do. And when these guys are out there doing their thing and they have such a big audience, it makes people aware that, you know, some of the, fav you know, your favorite people. I mean, you know, Tony's a wrestling god. There's no no better way to put it. You don't want him to be mistreated or mishandled or, or disrespected or none of those guys. So by people actually knowing, it's, you're, you're, you're actually calling out the people that are hurting the people you grew up with and you loved, right? That's right. Um, That's right. So, you know, some people go, yeah, you shouldn't say that. I'm like, well, you shouldn't be taking it if, if you're an honest uh, agent or booker promoter um you're doing what you're supposed to be doing you're taking care of your guy and look i'm not full of shit either and mike will tell you the same thing there's there's stuff on the other side of the business where there's also abusive wrestlers who i won't name at the current moment you know that i'll get grouchy and we have stories where i'll go you know i'm no slouch i, I fought for 15 years you make you make me growl I'll go nose to nose and be like look you're, you're pissing me off i'm like are we going to escalate this or are you going to behave and you know it happens on both sides um, you know, and I think sometimes when, when, when that kind of thing gets outed, you're, you're protecting the people you care about. You're protecting, you know, the authenticity of how things are supposed to work. Right. So that, that's why I think what they do, Tom, is, is so important because they bring that front and center. And again, sometimes the, the hardest conversations to have are the ones that, that no one wants to talk about because they're just that they're uncomfortable. Right. That's true. That's true. Hey, a uh, question from, uh, it looks like a fan of, um, Monty and the Pharaoh. Uh, innocent, what up, baby? There's Innocent McGuire. How do you feel about the art of storytelling in wrestling being lost today? Um, on my on my end of it, I think that we're in kind of strange times, right? Because so many so many fans now. When I was growing up, right, you didn't really know what was going on. You got magazines that were three months old, and those were your bibles, right? And that's the only kind of information you got. Right now, all the information, like with shows like us and other shows, the curtain's so pulled back. Fans nowadays, um, I don't think, have the same love for this. Well, I'm going to call it a sport, to be fair, because I think it is uh, in its own way uh, that people my age had at that time. So when we look and people say there's no storytelling, I think everything evolves. Uh, wrestling has gone back to a television sporting event. And within television, um, you don't have time to tell the story like you did back when we were watching. I, wa I used to watch, they had storylines that would evolve over months and they were incredible. You can't do that on TV anymore because today's audience, they don't have time. They don't have time to watch something build for months and months and months. So, as the gentleman just said, what do I think about the storytelling? I think the storytelling is different. I don't necessarily think it's worse. It's just different, right? Look, if I go back to an old wrestling match, which I love, right? Like Bob Backlund against Magnificent Morocco, right? I was in the garden many times, see that match. And uh, you watch it now. If that match took place now, the fans would boo that match out of the arena. So, um, is the storytelling not as good? It's just different. And in fact, I don't think wrestling fans really realize what's happening right now. There's some stuff going on right now that is better than the stuff from way in the past that we remembered and loved. I mean, I mean, right behind me is a picture of Roman Reigns. I don't know if you guys could see it right now. Roman Reigns is a new title, you know, new era wrestler. This right. guy, to me, is one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. He is quickly taking and going up the list. And when his time is said and done, he's going to be remembered as one of the all-time greats. So is it is it not good? It's different. 
That's that's my answer. That's right. And one thing Rocky brought up, I'll ask you guys this, is he brought up Andrew Anderson's name a few times. How is it possible a guy like Andrew Anderson, the look, uh, the mic skills, uh, the wrestling ability, how does this guy not get a shot at a bare minimum at NWA power, at a bare minimum? I mean, the guy has the look to be in the WWE. He had the look to be in AEW for sure, but... At a bare minimum, how is this guy not wrestling in NWA power? I, honestly, I've had the conversation with them, and I'm saying it out of love. Takes a knee to too many people. And when you take a knee, I know, Mike, you've seen it. When you take a knee to too many people, they will, especially in a business like that, you're done. They'll eat you for dinner. Um, because, like I said, the whole idea of, uh, and look, this is from Vince McMahon's mouth, not my mouth. Sports entertainment is to keep people entertained, right? Look, having great, your best wrestlers of all time were not necessarily the best physical wrestlers with the physicality. It was their mic skills. It was the character. It's what, what they brought. Um, that's, that's what keeps you entertained. That's what keeps you coming back. I mean, let's really be honest. Some of the best that you see is, you know, it's, a, it's an episodic soap opera, right? Of what you go, because you can't wait to see the next episode, see what goes on. So, look, you want to see incredible moves. Um, wrestling has changed a lot in the last two decades. Um, where instead of watching the big men fight and everything else, it's, you, then you've started to see the, you know, the day of the high flyers and everything else and, uh, and the luchadors and then New Japan and everything changing. But the one solidifier for all of them is to have somebody who's, who's a great character and a great mic, right? That's yeah. that's what you want. You want to be drawn to it. That's what brings people into the ring because it's that charisma. And so when it goes into something like that, if you know you bow and you take and you take a knee to too many people, Mike and Mike knows people I'm talking about. I won't mention that he's taking a knee to. I'm like they'll roll right over you. They and they don't give a shit. And I, and unfortunately, that's one of the ugly parts of the industry. You could be a nice dude. You could be a good dude. Uh, on for and if you keep your guard down too many times, people are gonna pull the proverbial rug out from underneath you right and so you're, you're going to see a lot of guys that you've looked at in the last four decades of wrestling that uh that probably should have gotten their fair their fair shake but if you bat if you take a knee and you bat everybody they're going to be like you're done they're going to you're just going to storm trooper right over you man you know and that's 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 my take mike i don't know what you think um I've known Andrew for a decent amount of time now, and I, I, I guess I totally agree. I mean, I couldn't have said it any better. Uh, I wish maybe then someone would have said, you know, before you, they said, Andrew, you got to change the way, you know, you got to become more political here. If you don't, you're just going to get shit on because it's a shame. To me, it's a shame. So, I mean, it's not because I use a friend of mine or I just like him. I mean, I remember well, you gotta, when, and you got to treat it like a business, right? You hit that certain age, yeah. too. If, um, and you look at some of the other guys, if you're acting more goofy all the time instead of business, all of a sudden the goofiness shoots you in the foot and they eat you for dinner. You're done. They just, they just, they, for whatever reason, even though that's, that's what the premise of what it's built on, they'll eat you for dinner and you're done. Well, that's in, that's in the real world too, right? I mean, you know, if you're in the business world, right, you got to look a certain role. You can't, you know, you, you, I mean, you know, with no disrespect, you can't be a slob and, uh, you know, you go to parties and the person that you bring into the party can't look like a slob. So, you know, uh, I, you're right. You you can't be a goof in this world. You can be a goof to be liked if that's what you want. But if you want to actually be successful, you can't be a goof. So, yeah, I agree. Good questions. Good hey, questions coming in. If any other fun. questions on wrestling or whatever you want to ask us, uh, feel free to ask hello. Um, so you're you're a you're a whiskey fan. We were talking about uh, New York whiskey. You like what do you like? I, I, I'm not a per se a whiskey fan. I do drink whiskey every yeah. so often. I'm more of a wine guy. You like wine, uh, I definitely love a cigar for sure. Um, most recently, I got you, I, dog. I love you, man. You know that. But uh, most recently, I just had uh, my second heart surgery. So it's like I had to tone down a lot of different things that I was doing. In fact, I've got to probably drop a few pounds now because I've been feeling back to my old self. And once you get back to your old self, you're getting back in your bad habits. But, yeah, I'm going to reintroduce the cigar back into my uh, my way of life. And I get very excited when I hear about it. like, again, 
I'm I'm no expert on it. So when I hear all these things about the mixes of tobaccos and the certain flavors, it interests me a lot, right? It's like, wow, I want to know more about this because I do want to be a connoisseur of, of cigar smoking. Um, whiskey, on the other hand, I always love a good whiskey, but it just takes, you know. Now, Farrell, on the other hand, that guy, he should have been on the show tonight. That guy, he knows his whiskey. He probably could have just talked about it the whole the whole show. Oh, it's all right. No, that's uh, that's good. You're you're feeling better, and you're uh, and you you like any 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 New York wines or any favorite wines you like in general? I'm I'm a, I'm a Merlot guy, so you know, just a solid Merlot will work for me. Um, yeah, uh, any kind of red wine. I'm not a white wine drinker. So I like to have a red wine with my meal and, uh, you know, on the weekends, things like that. I, you know, I have a habit once in a while of drinking too many bottles of wine. And, you know, it's funny if you if you drank beer most of your life and then all of a sudden you switch to wine. It's a totally different animal, right? It's like wine will put you on your ass quicker than you could imagine. So it's like it sneaks up on you and you're done. It's true. Oh, it's yeah. All different beasts. It's those tannins. It's the construction. All right. So now we actually look at this. Innocent, thank you. Innocent has uh, he has another exactly. question. Uh, do you feel that uh, Will Ospreay's style would work in WWE, and do you feel they would use him as one of the um, work in the world? Uh, Will Ospreay um, is a really talented wrestler. Uh, would his style work in the WWE? If that's a really good question. Um, I'm not so sure. Uh, Will, you know what? I'm going to say no on that. I don't think Will Ospreay is WWE material. And that's not saying he's not a great wrestler. The WWE, it's almost like uh, sports nowadays, right? You guys could be great third basemen and you could probably hit and you probably, you know, whatever. But if you're not six foot three and a certain hand size, it doesn't matter how good you could play. They're not they're not going to look at you. Right. Because you're not in those in that uh, that specification of what they deem a ball player. And and that, that's the way it's all analytics now. Right. It's all analytics. And so. Will Ospreay does not fall into the analytics of the WWE wrestler. Again, Rock could tell you, a WWE wrestler um, against an independent guy, if you put the average independent guy, the average AEW guy in the ring with a Randy Orton, it's like Andre the Giant and uh, a small person, right? It's it, There's such a big difference. So Will Ospreay does not fall into that WWE uh, specification, if that if, if that answers the question. So, no, Will Ospreay would not work in the WWE. All right. No, thanks. Thanks uh, for that insight. And Dennis and McGuire, thanks for the questions. Thanks to everyone watching. Keep on uh, liking and sharing this video. And uh, while you're at it, if you're a wrestling fan and you just want to hear something uh, really different, either way, uh, here's where to find them. Again, YouTube. There is the YouTube link. And then if you go on to all the podcast channels, uh, Monty and the Pharaoh is the place to look. When, when could you guys tell that this was really taking off? Was there something that happened, uh, a certain interview that was like, wow, now it's really taken off? Or was it more gradual? Was there something? It, it, like when we first entered the world of YouTube, that's when it started to take off. Because it was like all of a sudden you're seeing, you know, the world of Facebook, you know, you would see like, you know, a good a good day in the office would be twenty people watching you, right? right. And then you got into YouTube, all of a sudden you're watching. Oh, sh you know, shit, there's a hundred people watching. Then all of a sudden you see your video. Uh, one of our first shows on YouTube was with Tony Atlas. You spoke about Tony earlier, Rock. And I remember Pharaoh kept telling me, "Let's ask him about Bruiser Brody." And I'm like, "Dude, I don't want to ask Atlas about Bruiser Brody. I mean, that's been covered." to nausea right and if anyone doesn't know bruiser brody was a wrestler who was stabbed by the invader in puerto rico tony atlas was there and tony atlas was a big part of that whole murder uh trying to help bruiser brody and eventually was unsuccessful and tony found that his life in jeopardy after that so Farrell finally convinces us to ask the question we ask the question before you know it two days later there's 140,000 hits, wow. right? And it's 
And then YouTube starts contacting the channel, right? And I start doing these interviews with YouTube because of all their channels that they were that they were looking at, our channel had the highest retention time, well over the average YouTube. So in this social media world, everybody focuses on views, right? It's like, oh, I got this many views. I got this. I got that. It's the retention time, really. You can have a million views, and if they're for two seconds, that is not going to do you anything. You it's don't want flash about- in the pan stuff. Flash in the pan stuff is just quick in, quick out, and, and right. you're, uh, you're not capturing it. You don't actually have an audience. That's where you get to use the keyword. You went viral for X amount of minutes, and that was 15 minutes of fame. Yep. That's exactly it. So our retention time was very high. So that's when I knew this started to grow. And then, like we discussed earlier in the show, people would write us, thank you so much, or I hate you guys, shut up, let the wrestler, just ask him a question, you know, whatever else. But we knew we were drawing emotion out of people. So I, then I said to Jimmy, I'm like, look, we've got something here. I can sell this. And, uh, you know, I started going out to the world and started selling sponsors and people were all over it. And, uh, you know, one of the success stories, one of our sponsors is a, a company called Good Fucking Wines, right? And, you know, with a name like Good Fucking Wine, right? And we, I started, they started sponsorship with us when they first came out. These guys got so many orders from our show and they love working with us. Wow. That they've been around with us for three years. So, you know, uh, you know, all our sponsors, uh, ROIs are, are, are felt within three months on average. We've retained every sponsor since day one that they signed with us. And they continue to stay with us every, every year. And we just keep trying to build that. So our approach is that, you know what, no matter what size company you are, big and small, we want you to be part of the Monty and the fa- uh, Monty and the Farrell family. So, um, you know, that's basically how we knew that we kind of had something here. I love it, and uh, I, I'm gonna. Have to, I think I may not have heard of them. I just uh, in another tab looked. They actually have some whiskeys and vodka and wines. They have it all. So I, when they started, they had one red table wine. Right. One red table wine, and. Again, I don't want to brag, but I don't think anyone knew who they were until they were part of our show. And now, amazing, good fucking wine is well known. So, and it lives up to the name. Yes, uh, really good red table wine. Um, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's not just like one of you know, it's not like you know, it's flash in a pan wine. It's a, it's really an good. actual, it's a good wine. It's Morning. a good wine. Morning. Amazing. You guys have done so well. It's it's great to hear success stories uh, in, in this world, in media. Uh, not only a success story, but, uh, you know, a duo that's done something unique, different with an approach. So uh, hats off to you um, and the Pharaoh and Jimmy Farrell. I mean, you guys are really doing some great work and uh, it's really a real pleasure to have you on the show here. Well, it's my pleasure to be on the show and thank you. It's an honor. And uh, you got it, bro. Appreciate okay. you as always. You know that. Yeah, well, like I said, you know, like what you get, getting to meet people like yourself, very, you know, it's 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 humbling. So yeah, thank you guys. I I, I feel honored. Yes, and I'm gonna put it up one more time here. Uh, all podcast channels, there's where to find them, Monty and the Pharaoh, uh, or go to the YouTube link right here or watch. Um, where, what are the channels there uh, locally on the East Coast? Channel 115 and Channel 20, Long Island Cable. Check your local local cable listings. We're over 150,000 viewers watch us weekly. Wow, that's that's amazing. And get our merchandise on Pro Wrestling Tees. And if you just want to be able to contact us or get any of our merchandise or autograph pictures from some of the wonderful guests that we've had in studio, Go to Monty and A N D the and a new sponsor that has joined Monty and the Pharaoh is Manscape. You can get twenty percent off by using the discount code M A N D P when ordering your Manscape stuff. So, yeah, we're some of that, uh, some of that manscaping, right? We all we all need a little of that, don't we, Matty? I I I do, man. I, it's weird. I go through those blades like once every two weeks. I'm not. Is that good? That seems like it's probably not good. Yeah. You go through them that quick. How's that cigar looking? How's show us that that SP? Is it- Bobby, 
But every time oh. you break that ash, burns right back perfect again. Talk about manscaping. Look, Look at that, that man. Ash. Yep, yep. I'm a little jealous. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. And uh, and and so, hey, the other good news is we'll, we'll all be able to try one soon. We'll be excited uh, to try it. And, uh, again, congrats to Sanj uh, and the whole team there, how it's all grown, selling it out. Uh, couldn't be more proud of that. That's awesome. It's been a run, man. It's been what, what Sanj has done and put together with uh, – with the Larry on everybody else and, and Rolla, uh, it's it's really been nothing short of uh, of amazing, especially when you do something like that and you move those numbers and quantities grassroots, right? Uh, and, you know, that's something that we talk about here. That says a lot about what your product is, um, and especially when it's not, you know, very specifically, this isn't for label chasers. And when people smoke this, you know, even the label chasers have to kind of take a knee to, to what he's been able to do. Uh, and at that pricing. And, uh, you know, there's really nothing more that I could say about that I've been said in, in, in every episode. It's just been uh, what he's been able to do is, is no less than mind boggling. Uh, he's put the right teams together, the right people. Uh, and he's produced something truly amazing. Like I said, when uh, when you smoke these blacks, like I said, um, you're, you're going to be floored. You're going to be floored. The amount of taste, like I said, that natural. You take that dark cocoa and, uh, and goju pepper sweetness. Uh, medium, medium, full body, um, full of flavor down, down to the note. Uh, and the consistency is there every single time. And obviously, you know, just like a, just like a fine whiskey or a bourbon or a fine wine, uh, not only is it being really good important, but obviously being consistent time in and time out is obviously hugely important. So many great people watching tonight. It's so good to see so many of you all watching again. Uh, to everybody watching, thanks for watching. Maddie and I have so much great uh, content, interviews, more great guests coming uh, for you in 2023. And I'll talk about it next week. I actually just got back from Dominican Republic this past week. I'll tell you more about that um, later. Well, but, we, see you, we see you made it back, so I, don't, I guess you weren't in prison, so it's good. I made it back. Rob, I got to meet a local cigar there, or local cigar maker there, and some rum makers, and just had a fun time. Annabelle and I both did. Uh, but um, more to come on that. Um, thank you again for being. Where were you? Today. Glenn just had a Glenn shot a question. Where were you in DR, Tom? I was I was in Porta Plata. Porta Plata, Plata, right there. Yeah. yeah. We gotta, and then uh, we gotta we gotta do wine day too. Like I said, his wine cabinet. So we gotta have Glenn one day. So. You gotta have it. Gotta be war. It's gotta be whiskeys and bourbon versus the wines. I so love I'll, it. I'll we'll have a little bit of fun with that. Glenn. I'll send something to Glenn, and um, I'll even send some whiskey to Monty and the Pharaoh. Just we gotta get your info. I'd love to send you guys some whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. If guys, if I can promote one last thing, on yeah, February fourth, Chris Masters will be in studio, and Chris Masters is knowing something for the master lock. And I've put up the Pharaoh's name that he will do the master lock challenge. And if he can get out of the master lock challenge, we've already uh, collected $880, which will be contributed all that money and beyond. We still got a couple of weeks to go uh, to the St. Jude's Children's Hospital. So we're asking everybody out there, if you have the opportunity, Jimmy Farrow will take the master lock challenge if he can get out. All donations and proceeds will go to the St. Jude's Children Hospital. It's for a great cause. That's on February 4th with Chris Masters. Wonderful. Can we learn more about that on your website, too? Uh, Glenn, Glenn has something uh, yes, to add to that. Yep. Put that up there. I got the 120 to make it 1000 for you. Okay. I'm not sure I heard him. What did he say? I got the 120. Yeah, I'll make it a thousand for you. All right, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, man. Thank, thank you very you so much. much man. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so. Wow. You, wow. Thank welcome, you bro. very I'm much. Yep. I'll send. I'll send God you Glenn. Bless. I'll send you Glenn's info and everything. He, uh, another cat who's uh, as good as they get that always does stuff for charity and great causes. What a, what a wonderful thing. Unbelievable. It's a wonderful Humbling thing. yet again. Thank you guys for allowing me to uh, promote the Much show. Much love, everybody. We'll catch you all next weekend. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. guys. Cheers. See you, Sanj. See you.